Ark Royal. Named in honor of the galleon that led England to defeat the Spanish Armada, now she's facing her own death sentence. Though no one yet knows it, this will be her last international deployment. This series follows the Royal Navy's famous flagship on her final mission. For many of the 1,000 crew, this will be their first time away from home. The hopes and excitement seem a world away from the budget cuts to come. But for the boss, Captain John Clink, this was scheduled to be his final trip in charge of ARC. This is the best job in the world. It was as simple as that. But it's the people that deliver, and I'm extremely proud to be their captain. It'll turn out to be a dramatic mission, and there's only two hours till she sets sail. Start moving them down, John. Warrant Officer Cox takes charge on the flight deck. Right, move that way. Giving the first timers their first lesson in how to do things at sea Better. the Navy way. Move down. Come on, fella, get a move on. Face that way. I just shout very loudly, uh, and they tend to do what I say. Good. Stay, stay there, fella. Stay there. Stay there. Dress right. In front of my stick, face that way. Come on, fella, get a move on. I go all day. Fella, in front of me, yeah? Right, you three on the end, dress left. Left! Left! And I rock it, science! They're rehearsing a tradition called Procedure Alpha. Right, stay there. It actually dates back to Nelson's era, when the ship's company would go in and out of ports um, to show no hostile intent. They would man the decks, showing that they had no weapons manned or were carrying uh, any armament. So it's just a friendly show of strength. This way slightly. Stick is a pace stick, used to measure out length of distance when marching. Right, what we should have is 12 inches between their heels. 12 inches gives them a nice stable platform to stand at ease for any given length of time. For example, when we do November ceremonies in London, they stand at ease for two hours. Open up your legs. Don't worry, nothing's going to drop out. There we go, 12 inches between his heels. Any less of a distance, after any length of time, they will fidget. Yeah, and they will start twitching. And when they start twitching, I get annoyed. Right, I'm now going to send you away for a cup of tea, a fag, and a <laughs> You need to be back up here in your position by 10 hundred. Once we've sailed, You'll be brought to attention, and you do not move. You are not to wave at your boyfriend, girlfriend, mother, or anyone else. You are <laughs> until we get to round tower. Everyone happy? Right, cup of tea, bag, and happy. Right, where you go? It's anchors away, and Ark begins her passage through Portsmouth Harbour and out into the Solent. We're relying very heavily on the tugs to turn the ship because of the wind. Very unmanoeuvrable in at slow speed, but extremely manoeuvrable at high speed. We're reliant on the tugs controlled by the dockyard pilot to spin the ship round so we can get out of Portsmouth. The navigational channel out into the Solent is narrow because of the shifting sands on the seabed. Austin 154, we're going to make it to death 11 metres. With 50 hours safe, we're going to port and starboard through the gap. And with seven and a half metres of ship below the waterline, Ark Royal could easily run aground. It's extremely tight in terms of pilotage, but it's something that we practice all the time, so I'm pretty confident we'll be all right this morning. As the ship sails outside the security zone of the dockyard, she passes the round tower, where family and friends wave their goodbyes. It'll be five months before Ark Royal returns. Clearly, leaving families behind is always going to be hard, and so mixed emotions. It's going to be a very exciting deployment. We're going to see this ship operating as a flagship of a task group, but mainly it's going to be projecting air power, which we'll do with harriers and helicopters. We're going to embark four types of aircraft this afternoon, and we're all excited about doing that. Starboard 10. 
Midships do 182 reports there, Mark. For embarking, it's the job of Flight Lieutenant Chris Pearson, better known as Nick Nack, to guide them onto the Ark. Two by two. Okay, Roger. We set sail this morning. We're about 10 miles south of uh, the Isle of Wight. Um, and what the idea is to get the jets on as quickly as we can so the engineers have a chance to do all their bits and pieces and then we'll be ready to fly tomorrow. We're just about to recover the next two aeroplanes. Um, the holding pattern above the ship and the ship are all going into wind and then the jets will um, fly over the ship with three minutes to go to their landing time and we call that the slot. So they'll slot three minutes before um, and their landing time we call Charlie time. So they'll slot at minute 42 to land at minute 45. You can just make them out of the window, they're just going downwind now. There are four spots along the flight deck um, with, that you can land jets on, uh, two, three, four and six. And we're going to land them on three and four spot. That's the last two jets on. Um, and this afternoon, four more helicopters coming on in about 45 minutes' time. So the ship, you. you know, in terms of we only sailed this morning, so by the end of the day, we'll be quite busy. Coming up, Ark Royal gets ready for war. Hand structure stations, hand structure stations. Hands, hands, hands. The Navy's flagship, HMS Ark Royal, sailing north to Scotland to head up an international naval force for the very last time. Port swing 295. Ark's meeting the rest of her task group. Navies from Europe and the States will come together for an exercise called Joint Warrior. It's a test of her crew's ability to fight and defend the ship when she comes under attack. Joint Warrior is an exercise that the Navy has run for over 50 years off northwest Scotland. It's a bit of a, a, a snowball effect. The more navies we can get, the more complex you can make the exercise and the more attractive it is to other navies. And that enables a really quite complicated exercise to be planned, which is really good for our training. Starboard 20. 20 of starboard wheel on. Steer 114. Steer 114. Down in the operations room, they're gearing up for the first Joint Warrior Challenge. To the northern disputed zone towards uh, Norway. And we must be in a position to uh, project uh, power ashore and uh, protect ourselves. Hands to action stations, hands to action stations. Assume CBR and DC State 1, condition Zulu. The ship's preparing for war. And Warrant Officer John Walker, also known as Whiskey Walker, is in charge of damage control. Well, the ship is now at State 1 Condition Zulu. That's our highest state of readiness. Effectively, HMS Ark Royal is ready to go to war. My job now is to go around, quality control, all the checks, just to get people in the mindset of being at State 1. OK, got your manning list? Yep, got the manning list. Yeah. We've checked that all off and we're just about to spend our guys out to start closing down. OK, is everybody on board has got an action station. And we're going to close up now and just check that our manpower is in the right place, yeah, at the right time, and they all know what they're doing, what their jobs are. So. Fellas, so, right. you happy with your manpower? Yeah, happy with manpower. Uh, we had one person that was the wrong FRPP, but we've got them back now, so that's fine. Right. OK, what we're going to do now is a couple of drills. Uh, and the first one we'll do is, is the brace drill. Uh, and that's the position that we'll adopt if we detect a missile or an aircraft inbound. OK, FRPP, listen in. On, anti-flash! Brace! 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 Whiskey knows firsthand why these drills are so important. Yeah, I've done this a couple of times for real. First Gulf War, uh, we detected a missile inbound. Price! 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 When that call comes through, all sorts of things go through your mind. Family at home, uh, your wife, uh, your friends, there's, there's all sorts of things. Fortunately, that was a false alarm, but they did pipe it over the main broadcast, so it, it was quite frightening. 
What are you doing with an iPod at action stations? Come and see me afterwards. Everybody stand up on anti-flash. Brace, brace, brace. Remain in the brace position until you hear the pipe. Stand to. Years ago, we used to lie on the deck. When a couple of ships got hit down the Falklands, it killed people because they got lifted off the deck and then slammed back down. So we bend your legs and your, your legs act as suspension. That helps you ride out the shock of a missile hitting the ship. Stand to, stand to. Relax, anti-flash. Right, who was it had the iPod? Right, report to me in HQ1 when we fall out from action stations. We'll have a discussion. They can't hear pipes over the main broadcast if they listen to music on an iPod. Right, but you'll find a lot of the young lads, what they'll do is they'll wear an iPod underneath their anti-flash and think they'll get away with it. But uh, we just obviously caught that young lad red-handed. I will deal with him later. I don't think he'll bring an iPod to his action station ever again. Action stations on HMS Art Royal. Doesn't get any better. With Ark now leading the Auriga task group, she starts her journey to the United States and Canada. The Harriers aboard Ark need practice. They land vertically, but to save fuel, they take off from the ski jump. And neither procedure is easy when the runway is traveling at 30 knots. Flight Lieutenant Chris Pearson has been a Harrier pilot for five years. We're going to get everyone during the daytime and then we'll uh, aim to land on the ship at about 25 minutes after sunset, so it'll be a sort of what we call light duskers, so it'll be nearly dark, but not quite, so it's the first kind of step to doing it in darkness, really. I've never landed on an aircraft carrier at night. This is for us to see, the, see all the night lighting, see the references, practice the approach, and then slowly work towards doing it in full darkness. Qualify, Chris has got to complete three successful night landings. Lieutenant Commander Paul Tremling's already got his wings to fly in darkness. The reason we fly at night is to give us a, a tactical advantage over people who can't. Uh, that's why we do it. And yes, it is disconcerting, but uh, you have to do it in today's battle space. The key with night landings are that you don't have all your peripheral cues that you would usually have to tell you that the aircraft's going one way or another. You don't have a ship slipping past, you don't have the texture on the sea, so you have to be absolutely rigid in believing what your instruments are telling you and looking out the window and being disciplined to make sure that you land in the right place, because there's simply nothing else to help you. What we had today was uh, darkness, so they're looking at the lights and they are able to use the day techniques whilst at the same time having to realise that what the night techniques uh, require. Tomorrow they will simply have no choice. It will be that dark that they won't be able to see the ship, it will be lights only and they need to use the right techniques or things are going to go pretty badly quite quickly. She's absolutely fine in place today. The engine still works. I don't know why I can't just land a thing like that during the daytime. It's lovely yeah, landing. Like that, yeah, it's good fun. Um, it was nice to go flying, you know, quite late in the day, see the ship at sunset, and then um, go back out uh, into the hold for about half an hour, and then, uh, yeah, yeah, shoot an approach. It was just kind of light enough to be able to see the superstructure <coughs> and some of the references you can use during the daytime, but um, you can still see all the night lighting and stuff, so it's quite a good, uh, I guess, quite a good intro for tomorrow night when it'll be um, a little bit darker. but there's a darkness of another sort out on the horizon. One that's about to cause chaos across Europe and the North Atlantic and will transform Ark Royal's final mission. Medal of his forecast speaking. Hello, sir.
The ship's weather team has been monitoring the cloud in the last few hours. There's a volcano on the, the southern edge of uh, Iceland which has erupted uh, overnight and that's um, spewing ash up into the atmosphere. You can see a red streak here which uh, looks like where uh, the, the first spread of the ash is and also the, the black area would also indicate a potential ash cloud. I'm not on there at the moment. I think the boss might be. Uh, this is uh, very unusual. I've been doing uh, uh, meteorology for 24 years now, and uh, it's not something I've ever seen in uh, this part of the world. Um, we're not really sure exactly what is going to happen. With airports closing throughout Europe and thousands of flights grounded, the second-in-command of the ship, Rob Belfield, has no option. How are you there? Good morning, Aunt Royal. Uh, Commander speaking. Uh, you would have heard of the impact on flying in the UK airspace from the uh, ash fallout from the Ic Icelandic volcano. As a consequence, all fixed wing and rotary flying from Ark Royal has been suspended uh, while we wait for further direction and guidance. No one on the ship's ever encountered anything like this before. And it's bad news for Harrier pilot Chris Pearson. Yeah. Um, looking at Saturday. Um, yeah. He's due to do the second and more difficult part of his flight training tonight. Well, we've cancelled flying for today. We're still waiting for a decision from the ship about what time we may or may not be able to start flying again. We're only on for another uh, week and a half, so we've got a certain number of trips to get done and, and now uh, one less night to get it done in, really, but we should still get it finished before the end of the deployment. Volcanic ash is a, is a new one on me, so... Um, yeah, we'll see what um, we'll see what happens. It's it's just a bit here, isn't it? Lieutenant Marie Steele's plotting the movement of the ash cloud and its dangers. Ash is is quite abrasive and it can cause damage to things like aircraft windows and that kind of thing. If it falls in in rainfall as well, it can be fairly damaging to um, the superstructure. It's a sulfuric acid, so it's so it's mildly corrosive as well. Um, and when it falls and it's wet. When it dries out, if it's not washed away fairly quickly, when it dries out, it can form like a dry cement. So obviously we don't want that to stick on our upper deck because it's quite important for us at the moment that we get it right and we know if it's going to affect us and if we're going to get any ash fallout with the rain that comes on Saturday. Coming up, just when they think things can't get any worse, they do. Ark Royal sprung a leak. HMS Ark Royal's only days into her last ever international deployment, heading up a task force to the United States and Canada. But the volcanic eruption in Iceland produced an ash cloud that suspended all flying across Europe. While other airports have had to close, Ark Royal has a unique advantage. We are an airfield that can move. One of the issues we're looking at is where can we reposition uh, to con continue, continue our exercise. And of course, in operations, that has, this, has the same value. But uh, you know, if, if you've got a, a weather front coming through or there's a certain threat in one area, then we can mo move to another area and still deliver air power from there. It's down to Marie Steele and the team of meteorologists to work out the best place to find clean air. So what we've got here um, is a chart that we've drawn up based on some Met Office um, information. The red line here shows us where the um, ash cloud is going to be. What we can see is that we're just right on the border of where we think the uh, potential effects of that are going to be at around about 9 o'clock this morning. So we're looking at increasing our speed at the moment to uh, move further and further away from there, out to the uh, west of the Hebrides, just around, and we're going to be operating down to the south of the Minches here throughout the day today. It's excellent news for us. It means we can carry on with our, uh, our programme as we were doing uh, beforehand and just again shows the flexibility of the carrier being able to move from uh, the area what, that we couldn't operate in around to an area that we can, which means that potentially we could have the only aircraft flying in UK airspace. But until the ship finds clean air, there's the threat of acid rain. With corrosive volcanic ash on its way, the aircraft have got to be brought off the deck and stowed safely in the ship's hangar to protect them from potential damage. The man overseeing the task is suitably called Petty Officer Ash. This is the forward hangar. We've got two Merlin aircraft in the forward hangar at the moment, and we're just about to bring a Lynx down and try and put it in as well, which is unusual. Uh, but basically, we're getting as many in as we can to get them off the deck, and hopefully they won't be contaminated with any volcanic dust. 
I said, well done. Line her up. To move the aircraft into place, the crew uses a remote-controlled electric handler called a ram, capable of towing 25 tons. Are you confident? It depends if he, uh, how much lock he gets on it, yeah? He gets it right over. Yeah. All right, take it off. That's a bummer, isn't it? It's really close, isn't it? The difficulty is we've got a fire curtain here. Yeah, we've got to keep that clear at all times. We'll try for another five minutes. Uh, then we'll obviously have to look at plan B. There's room for the links at the far end of the hangar behind the Harriers, but it'll be a job to get it there. Still not clear. And for Petty Officer Ash, there's a financial incentive to fit the aircraft into this tight space. Yeah, there is a bit of a bet going on because there's a few people on the ship said we couldn't get this in. What we're doing now is we're going back to the old fashioned method, yeah? We're not going to do it by hand. So keep coming, keep coming. This is going to be too much hard. No, no, we'll try, we'll give it one go, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, four shot, Hold on, hold on, hold on. Well done, that's it. Push, lads, push, well done. But he hasn't won his bet yet. How are we going to lash it? Can we not rig something up? We've got it in. It's in. The difficulty is, if you look on the deck, there's only so many lashing points that we can actually lash your aircraft through these ring bolts here. Even though we've got them in position, we can't safely keep in that position if the ship obviously moves. So what we're going to do is we're going to take it out and we're going to put it down in the after end of the hangar. Uh -huh. So you win your bet? Mm, I would say it's 50-50. It's in, but it can't stay in. <laughs> so we just like to move out of the way because it's actually going to move the aircraft. Excellent, well done, lads. That's it. Put your knee on front. But the ash cloud isn't all bad news. All the way forward. I'm getting onto the top of the ramp and back. For Chief Physical Training Instructor Steve Losh, it means the flight deck's open for business. His business. Good. PT classes. This is lovely. This is bliss. This is. This is perfect condition. This is what we live for. Sidestep and bring in the arms! Bring in the arms! This is obviously their time off now, so they've been on watch all day. This is their time to wind down. Look at these guys here, they're winding down right now, Fez. Yeah, winding down, lads. Good, carry on jogging with everyone else. Get to the mats! Keep him off! Keep him off! I, I live for my job, I mean... Uh, over nearly 20 years I've been in the, in the Naval Service now and, and 18 of them I've been a physical training instructor, so I'm very grateful for what the Navy has given me. Come on, get a partner, let's go, 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 go! This is possibly my last sea job as a physical training instructor and to do it, to come here on the flagship HMS Ark Royal and finish my time at sea, this is a fantastic way for me to end. Last one, drive, and we're back! <laughs> Down on eight deck, Whiskey Walker, the ship's damage control expert, has been called to the aft engine room. A keen-eyed patrolman spotted a hole in the ship's hull. You can see a leak in the build. That's just going to get worse, so we can't ignore it. Uh, we've got to get down there, and we've got to effect a repair on that leak before it does get worse. The leak's in an area that's difficult to access. It can't be welded. They've got to work out the quickest way to stop it. So if we get the circumference of a pipe, yeah. we could get two pieces of wood yeah. together, yeah. cut the hole out, and then we could trim the bottom so it sits in there nicely. And the cement will go all round that pipe as well. Yeah. Yeah. We'll uh, build a little timber frame. Once we've got a timber frame around the leak, uh, we use uh, quick uh, hardening cement, which is set in just over five hours. It's only a semi-permanent repair. When we get into dock, we'll have to carry out permanent repairs. That's it. If we left it untreated and just left it, we could pump out the water, but if it got that catastrophic, that we couldn't cope, the water level would increase, and therefore the stability of the ship would be compromised. Excellent. This is basically called a cement box. 
will fit it around the pipe that's obviously running this way. We'll then use this section to go on the front. We'll secure at the back, fill the box up. Obviously, we'll try and get the leak in the centre of the box as best we can. Once we've topped it all up with cement, the cement will naturally cure, even though there is the presence of water, uh, and it will go off and just make a seal. Happy with that? Yeah, yeah. OK, then. Well, we better crack on then. Gaz, do you want to get in there? Gaz Booker's Colin Payne's assistant, and he's got to squeeze himself between the pipework to try and reach the leak. Pretty crap down there. It's not too bad up here. OK, Gaz. Try and slide that under. Good job, he's thin. Happy that. Cheers, Shannon. Thank you. You won't find anything like this in a document or a book or a folder, etc. Really, you've got to do it off the cuff. Obviously, you've got an idea of how to make a box, but because of the situation you're in, there's always obstacles. So it's a case of putting it in there, it doesn't fit, chopping a little bit off and reattaching it. And it's a bit of a suck it and see type exercise. Yep, perfect, spot on. I've had it happen twice to me, and this being the second time. This is not bad for 23 years. The cement being mixed because it comes obviously dry. We'll get it into the box itself. Uh, we'll put a small amount in first just to make sure that we've got a good coverage. And then we'll just top the box up. OK, guys. After approximately five to six hours, it should go off. After 24 hours, it'll be solid. Gaz has been down there for nearly an hour. Just got a few more drums of cement to mix. Uh, he'll put them in there because he's sit down there. And once we're happy, he can come out then. He's happy anyway. <laughs> By now, HMS Ark Royals moved over 200 nautical miles south to avoid the volcanic ash cloud that's closed much of UK airspace. Uh, ..towards us, uh, but as we move southwards, we're getting towards the far edge of it, and so uh, conditions are improving for the ship's position. Yes, please. Which means Harrier pilot Chris so Pearson can continue his deck landing blue. training. Um, he's got two more flights to do before he's qualified to land in darkness. We've come down the west coast now, we're off um, Presswick, and we're clear of the uh, volcanic ash, so we can fly now, so that's why we're flying tonight. I'm about to go and do what's called dark duskers. So the other night I did light duskers, which was landing about half an hour after sunset. Tonight it'll be about 45 minutes. So um, it'll probably be a little bit darker, obviously. There should still be just enough light to see the ship. So it's kind of the next step to, towards doing it in complete darkness. 77 is ready, as upper strobes bust. Up in flight control, fellow Harrier pilot Major Jim Dresner, known as Judge, is the landing signals officer. He'll be supervising Chris's takeoff and landing. Tonight, it's not going to be pitch black, but it's going to be after sunset. It's going to be after evening civil twilight, so it will be quite dark. So it probably will be a little bit apprehensive, but it's, it's not at the stage where you're completely pitch black. At night, our main role is really just to reassure the pilot, Ash, and speak in a reassuring voice, make sure he doesn't do anything stupid, and, and try and get him down safely. When you actually go off into the pitch black and recovering the pitch black, uh, that's when it becomes a, a little bit more cheeky. But uh, tonight for him, it, it's a big step. It's, it's probably the most challenging thing you'll do uh, in a harrow is trying to land it at night uh, on a moving ship. Yeah, we've currently got four pilots who are night qualified. Uh, it's been a while because of all the Afghanistan commitments. It's been a long time before actually any of our Harrier squadrons have been able to come on board and get the experience really to progress tonight. So, go go one four months new Q and H one zero three two. Hopefully, by the end of this trip, we'll have six night qualified Harrier pilots, which effectively would be enough if we did go to an, some kind of operation. We would be able to maintain some kind of twenty four hour capability because we'd have enough pilots to fly during the day and enough pilots to fly during the night as well. Four miles now is about to start his descent from a thousand feet. It's not properly dark, so it's not too bad. He should be feeling fairly confident about what he's about to do. 
And the torque down control has just told me slightly below the glide path, so it's correcting onto it now. That's a nice speed, Now the nice side is about 90 feet above the sea. He's slowing right down now using the nozzles. Just holding slightly. Nice height. Nicely on the Roger. So now he's going to take over visually. He's going to try and position himself at about 90 feet alongside the spot. He's coming down nicely. He's nice and slow as well, which is what I like. I don't want him coming in too fast. Nice position. Nice height. Just visually judging now, he's at a nice height. He's just going to bring the aircraft slowly across over the deck now. You're over the deck. Deck's pitching slightly, which isn't helping him. Hopefully, he's not chasing it too much. He started to come across nice and slowly. Nice position. Welcome back. Welcome to channel one. Yeah, it was all right tonight. It was good fun. It's all right, see? It's a lovely night, and um, yeah, it was good. It was good fun. Coming up, bad news for the pilots. Their mission's aborted. I think it's a complete spoof. And Ark Royal's deployed on an urgent rescue mission. HMS Ark Royal will be used to help bring Britons home. For the last 48 hours, HMS Ark Royal's been doing her best to avoid the volcanic ash cloud that's closed UK airspace. In 26 years in the Navy, I haven't come across uh, a volcanic explosion that has caused the uh, stoppage of aviation across the whole of Europe, a pretty unprecedented uh, event. And we've done our best to dodge the ash as much as we can and still participate in the exercise, but once, once the whole exercise area is um, is covered by the by the ash cloud. Then there's really no option but to stop flying, which is which is very disappointing. The ash clouds followed the ship, so all flying stopped again, leaving the engineers frustrated and with time on their hands. We've done all the maintenance over the past couple of days, and there's nothing really we can do. All the jets gone down in the hangar, and well, we're loafing. <laughs> It's a bit boring, really. There's not much else you can do except from wait for the other shift to come on, chill out, tads out. <laughs> That's about it, really. <laughs> Harrier pilots with a no-fly ban means a lot of bored guys and one girl. <laughs> We're not allowed to fly because of the volcano again. Don't know exactly why this time, so the, the, the reasons are many and varied about where exactly this dust cloud is and what exactly we're allowed to do because it's there but uh, essentially we've been told no fly today so um yeah the, the boys all appear to be around the, the wee <laughs> it's incredibly frustrating uh, carrier aviation when you're actually doing it is the one of the more exciting things that you could ever be asked to do uh, but to sit here not doing your primary function is incredibly frustrating <laughs> They seem to be managing, don't they? <laughs> the news from the Met Office isn't good. We're just here at the moment. Uh, the red solid line here is uh, where we think the fallout zone will be at 12 o'clock, and the red pecked line is where we think it will be at 1800. So it is actually closing around our position at the moment. I have to be hopeful. It's my job to uh, try and look on the bright side. We're getting the blame for it at the moment. <laughs> it's, um, unfortunately, it's one of those acts of God and we've just got to work around it and see what we can do. But despite the flying ban, the hangar crew has been told to move all the Harriers back onto the flight deck. And orders come through from the UK. The pilots have been told to fly the jets off the ship immediately to the naval station at Presswick and leave the rest of the squadron around 100 engineers and admin staff behind. We need to go. Yeah, the jet's ready. <laughs> it's uh, disappointing to be uh, ending the detachment early, but uh, 
There we go. You can't really cater for volcanic eruptions. That's no one's fault, really. It's a big blow for pilot Chris Pearson, who won't be able to complete his training. It's a little bit disappointed in not being able to um, finish the night work up, really. So, but there are obviously bigger priorities. So we're going to get off today, uh, take the jets ashore, and then see what um, see what effect this volcanic ash has, I guess, in the next week or so. It is frustrating because I'm sure everyone's acting on the um, on the best advice that they've got, or they're acting to the the best of their abilities, given that there is no advice going round. There is obviously a lot of dust in the atmosphere, but a, a lot of it might only be as bad as a minor sandstorm or a minor dust storm that you might experience in Afghanistan. The trouble is, I don't think anyone really knows. Particularly in today's society, there's a natural reaction to default safe, um, go mega safe, which is uh, not quite how I'd do things, but um, I'm not the one making the decisions and not the one that would underwrite the multi-million pound disaster should it actually happen. And is he worried about flying into this ash cloud? No, I think it's a complete spoof. Well, I think in art law, we're used to taking things on the chin, but actually this is a pretty big punch because um, without the aeroplanes, we are just a steel box and driving around. There's a powerful sense of disappointment. Of course, my job as a captain is to make sure that I don't allow that uh, I don't allow too much of a dip in in morale. But it would be, you know, be naive of me to think that, uh, that everyone is as cheerful uh, today as they were yesterday when we were doing our primary business. But every cloud has a silver lining, and two days later, HMS Ark Royals back in business. Good afternoon, Ark Royals captain speaking. Well, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, uh, to work out that things have changed for this ship uh, fairly dramatically. And uh, as a consequence of uh, planning that has gone on ashore, uh, we have been directed to uh, head south at best speed. And we are going uh, back to Portsmouth to conduct ferrying operations to get uh, entitled British citizens uh, back from the continent, probably from Cherbourg, uh, back to the UK. So what you need to do now is to start thinking how you play your part in embarking uh, up to 2,000 uh, civilians and the preparations that are required. That's all. We've been tasked The by captain's second-in-command, Rob Belfield, Command is meeting Command with all the heads of departments. What we specifically in our Royals Command Group has been asked to look at is our capacity, our numbers that we can take best guess around that, you would probably increase it to 50 <coughs> for an overnight. I mean, we've, we've got 1,200 bumpers on board, another 1,200 in the hangar or whatever, so we're looking, I'd agree, 15, about 1,500. Right, OK, the question is, could we do 1,500 people overnight without going to Fazlane first? I think the answer yes. is yes. 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 Yep, OK. And, over, and just for a daily hop, could we take 2,000? Yes. Yes, yes. No, OK. We need to replicate the sort of facilities a ferry would provide. You know, we need to feed, water, entertain, look after. You know, I've got two children, and I know how, how bored they get on a ferry for six hours. You know, we're going to have to do that with, with many more, without all the sort of normal facilities. Yeah. So the chaplain's a good magician, so we're going to do some tricks. You know, there's all sorts of things we can do to, to, uh, you know, to turn our talents to, to meet the need. HMS Art Royal will be used to help bring Britons home. I think if you, uh, if you flick the television on, actually, for the news channel and you see your own ship as the headline, closely followed by the Prime Minister, uh, makes you realise the importance of this ship to the nation. The crew hasn't got long to get things prepared. Let's get all that ground equipment up there and get the ground equipment up past it and then we'll start getting it back. Once the aircraft are taken out of the hangar, we're going to start setting up the hangar, making it safe for the people that are coming on board so they can relax in the centre part of the hangar. So we will be working through tonight to get the hangar. Help our, uh, our fellow citizens and, and sailors are good at that. Next time on HMS Ark Royal. You're going to get a lot of fog uh, and the risk of icebergs. We're filling up a lot faster than we thought. A bit of a problem. There's a crack that needs repairing. Welding will be necessary on the outer ship's bottom. We're about to start heading across the Atlantic. We've had the rug pulled away from us. 